I'm a lot less successful than people think I am. <laughs> people come and take a selfie and then say, what's your name? What's your name? I can be jealous and I can state that and I'm like, oh my god, Katrina Kaif is hot as yeah. well. Like, who the f*** is that? Yeah. You can be those things. I couldn't find a place to live, I remember. Like, nobody would give me a house to rent in Bombay as a But single woman. But is it because you're, yeah. As oh a single god. woman. And I'm like, I'm famous. Do, you want to take selfies with me, but you don't want to give me a house. Hi Kalki. Hi. How are you? I'm very good. I'm so excited to have this chat with you. I know we've been trying to do this for a while yes. and I'm so glad that our sort of calendars have synced. Yes, I'm also very glad that I could catch you on your business trip. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing today? Good, good. Yeah. You know, I find your journey so interesting. And mm -hmm. I think of course because pretty much from Dave D to I think the last that I saw of you was Made in Heaven season two. Yeah. I've found, of course, your choice is very interesting and your acting is spectacular. I think nobody can doubt that. That's something that Thank everybody you. has unanimously sort of agreed upon, which is that your craft is extremely fine. But I think um, I love the fact that uh, you've really done this on your own terms. Yes. <laughs> and, and I want to ask you that. What did it cost you to really do this on your own terms? Um, what has it cost me? I guess it costs me that um, I'm a lot less successful than people think I am. <laughs> In the sense that I'm famous, yeah. but I live a very simple life. Um, and I do spend a lot of time not working and being at home and, you know, as you know, now living in Goa and raising a child. Um, so it, it's it's a choice and I do a lot of theater, I produce theater. So, you know, that's not exactly a, 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 a you know, a, how do you say, like a very business oriented thing. It's very much art for the sake of art. Yeah. So I, it, it, it's one of those things where people know me and see my face and everyone is really familiar with me, but then they're really surprised to see me, you know, on public transport, for example. They're like, how can you not be with bodyguard? How, you know, like it's this weird dichotomy hmm. where um, somehow I, I have an image which is bigger than who I really am. That's so fascinating you say that the, that the image is greater than you. But I think, do you think that it's because you've played very, very memorable sort of characters that people have resonated with so much? You know, like even parts like Natasha. Yeah, yeah, you know, in I mean, it's it basically boils down to those two movies, in the Ginamali ki Dibara and Ye Jawani Hai Diwani, no, which are still seen by yeah. every 15 year old, every 12 year old, everywhere I go, every restaurant, every, you know, every mall, I, I meet a 12 year old or a 15 year old who's like, I just watched your film last night. Yeah. You know, so I loved your those, Bhagwati. <laughs> yeah. Those films just have just continued yeah. um, to, to sort of live. And that's been amazing for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, strangely, Neil, we had a chat with Neil Bhupalam and he said that he's also an avid sort of theater yeah. uh, performer. And, and I asked him, I said, you know, like the, I'd gone to see in a play by Rajat Kapoor and, and there were, it wasn't like it was a full auditorium and the tickets were cheap. So I was really trying to do the math mm. that, you know, like, okay, so these many people are in this auditorium. It must have cost something to rent the auditorium. And then there is an ensemble cast of actors and then there's lighting and all of that. Yeah. So how are we kind of making money in this sort of proposition, as you said, the economics of it? Yeah, and you said, no, the actors don't get paid. I was just saying, but what do you get paid? And he's just, just enough money for maybe a banana and a coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get paid for travel and uh, it's, it's very basic. And I produce theater, so I know you just... I, you know, I'm a celebrity. I managed to sell all the tickets most of the time. I get mm. full houses, but I still just make make ends meet. Like I just managed to pay my actors a little bit, pay for the uh, production costs, and then I'm done. There's no profit. But is money a mo motivator? Not for theater. But for you? Um, definitely, of course. There are things I do just for money. Of Would course. you care to share anything that you may have done just for money? Mostly like corporate gigs, 
hmm. um, you know, things where you know you're, it's an exchange. It's a, you know, they want your face and you, you, you want the money. <laughs> hmm. But is it like um, events where you have to, let's say, deliver a talk or is it like a ribbon cutting? Sometimes it's or? hosting, sometimes, sometimes it's delivering. A lot of it, the, the kind of work I get is usually talks on feminism or a performance of one of my monologues for corporate events. Hmm. Uh, so it's still quite meaningful for me. I still get to input, uh, you know, the kind of work that I do. Yeah. Um, um, but I wouldn't do it under a certain cost. Hmm. And I'm very clear about that. Hmm. So, yeah, those kind of things, uh, you know, actually balance out the theater work or whatever. Yeah. You know, funnily, Irfan Khan had said, and I recently saw an interview, Huma, where she quoted him. And she said that uh, he had told her that, you know, in your life, you will only do four or five memorable roles. Hmm. That, you know, your sort of career, uh, you know, graph as an actor will be remembered by. Hmm. Everything else is just EMIs. <laughs> like you can't forget that you have EMS. Absolutely, to pay. I think people forget that you know this is our job. Um, you know, everybody says this is my bread and butter. You know, I get that a lot from journalists. But it's my bread and butter. I'm sorry, I'm writing crap about you, but it's my bread and butter. Hmm. You know, so w people forget that we are also, you know, having rents to pay, uh, families to take care of, uh, and things like that. So of course. Of course, we do things for money and we do things for the love of art. Yeah. Um, and it is very rare to come by a good script. Very mm. rare and, and, you know, it's few and far between. So you wait for those. Yeah. And you jump on them. And you're lucky uh, when you get paid to do what you love. Yeah. Uh, which does happen as well. There are sometimes those happy marriages of, you know, uh, doing a project which you love and has money and backing behind it the rare kind of marriages <laughs> yeah the rare kind of marriages exactly but what is that waiting phase like it can be tough for, of course um i think over time it gets easier just because you know the you know the drill you know that this is gonna go up and this is gonna go down uh in the beginning you feel like oh my god i'm never gonna work again and you're like, oh my God, that was just a fluke that I managed to get anywhere. Um, but yeah, then you see the trends and you're like, okay, now here I am up again. And then suddenly I'm down again. Um, so that's happened enough for me to kind of deal with it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's probably why I, I get my fingers into like things like theater or writing. Because I, as, a, as an actor, I feel like we are not always, like we don't have that discipline that maybe a, a musician has, that you have to do your daily riyas. Yeah. And so we don't know quite how to do our daily riyas because ours is so much about other people in the room and, yeah. and you know, bouncing ideas, bouncing uh, energies and all of that. So in order to keep that going for me, it's like do play readings, uh, do a theater uh, performance, um, meet with other actors, exchange ideas, you know, create things. So that that kind of, that's my riyaz. And that's what I do uh, in those pauses, in those mm. moments. What was the first low like? When did you experience it and what were you feeling? Right after Devdi. Mm. Right after Devdi, I didn't have another film for about two years. I think the next film was Sindhagi, actually. Hmm. Um, but for those two years, I was doing a Skeleton Woman. It was a play that I co-wrote with Prashant Prakash. And we just happened to win uh, an award for the Metro, uh, Metro Plus Award. The Metro Plus Award, I think yeah. it's called. And it gave us, I think, one lakh rupees prize. And with that, we set up our first you know shows and managed to get the play running and we ran that play for a couple of years but how do so, you survive like monetarily in those years i mean you eat vada pao you <laughs> travel by train um you know you what do we need to you know, we need a certain basic amount to, yeah. to survive i have so many friends who do theater all year round mm. and i i also i'm a, i'm in awe of how they survive um, it's hard to run a family for sure, hard to, you know, 
pay for your children's education it's and expensive. things like that. Exactly. Children are expensive. Children are expensive for sure. You would know. <laughs> I I do know. I do. So you know, I I think that it's not easy, but but yeah, there are you know there are ways to do it, and and I think it's again that balancing act of like getting a a corporate gig. Also, theater, we do a lot of corporate gigs. Nobody talks mm. about that. But most of our plays, we've also sold to corporates. So then you do those corporate gigs for a lot more money. Mm. And then you do the Prithvi gig for very mm. little. For you. But how are you feeling in those moments? Like, do you feel like, let's say, those two years that you spoke about when mm. you were doing this play, but the play like kind of kept you motivated, I'm sure, to kind of just keep showing up. Mm. But how do you feel emotionally in the initial times when you weren't? you know, getting the right script or you didn't have another film. Mm. Uh, what toll does that take on you personally? I mean, it's hard to say because that was so early in my career that, you know, I didn't expect anything different. I'd been doing theater for five years before. Mm. And in the middle was this, an the anomaly was doing a film. The anomaly, the anomaly was doing something successful in the middle. Yeah. Uh, so this was going back to normal, actually. Um, Got it. Because I was doing my little ad gigs here and there, you know, just to, to pay the rent. And at the same time, I was, you know, working uh, on creative stuff. So that, that was how I had lived for the five years before the the. And I had studied drama. I had gone to London. I was I was waitressing. I was you know teaching in a in a in a in a school. I was doing many many things. So that that was part of life for me always. Um, so I don't feel it was so difficult then, but I feel it did get harder. Like for example, after Ye Jawani, after Zindagi Na Milegi, to have those lulls after that mm. was harder because you kind of got used to a kind of a rhythm of getting work coming you, yeah. your way regularly. Also popularity because and those became very iconic sort of characters and those are some yes. of the most memorable films as you yes. said. And also what comes with that is the stereotyping. So then you only get this role or that role. Hmm. Um, so all of those come with, with a certain baggage of like, oh gosh, um, now what do I do? Like do I just keep repeating the same thing? Yeah. Um, because also nobody knows uh, what you didn't say yes to. You know, nobody knows how many times you said no and what you've turned down. And I've turned down both monetarily big projects as well as projects which just seemed like, oh God, I'm just repeating the same thing again and mm. again and I'm st being stereotyped. So, But that's a so risky that's proposition. A, that's turning tough, down, like, yeah. even though it's yeah perhaps creatively not satisfying, mm. but at, in those times you're just like, probably thinking, okay, what next? And if I don't do this, then what? And will something better come along? So it must yeah. have been like a courageous choice to make then. Yeah. And I guess you do. There are moments where you're insecure, like, oh my God, I made the wrong decision. And you're sitting at home, you don't have work and you're worried about money. Um, but you also, I, I guess for me, those quiet times are also when I've created the most. Um, where I've sat down and you know wrote the elephant in the womb, for example, my book, or yeah. you know if or the or some of the monologues, some of my monologues that I've written on on womanhood, for example, um, those always happened in in these lulls mm. where I was going through very difficult personal adversity as well, uh, as well as not having career. Because I think that's one thing when you don't have like work as an actor it's quite it's part and parcel of our mm. lives but when you don't have work and you're dealing with pressure on a personal front oh uh, yeah it's like when it rains it pours yeah. right and it's like yeah. trouble just comes in like a big bunch um but we forget that so does success right yeah suddenly you're feeling all the success of everything at the same time and that's i think the the beauty of it is that just everything passes the bad times pass the good times pass too unfortunately <laughs> yeah. and you know like no character was ever built in the absence of crisis so i imagine that you know i think yeah. the dips are very necessary for our growth as human beings yeah but yeah when everything falls apart together i think that is it's a tough time it's tough it's a tough time and i think funnily 
most women that I've met have mm. experienced this at some point in time, at least in their 20s, mm. where they felt very dissatisfied with where their career is going because they've been working really hard and it's kind of not working out. And at the same time, they've had some sort of romantic trouble or some issue with parents. So, you know, just in general, when mm. emotionally you're not at your best, yeah. but at the same time, no part of your life is then rewarding you in the way that you'd like it yeah. to reward you. Yeah. And I think those are... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are tough ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are tough moments. Are yeah. you reminiscing? <laughs> yeah, no, of course, of course. There's, um, you know, the big obvious one was after I had, when, when me and Anurag divorced, I had just finished Ye Jawani ha and Zindagi had come out. I think, you know, those two films that were out there, Zindagi first and then Ye Jawani. Yeah. And then there's this divorce. And then I couldn't find a place to live, I remember. Like nobody would give me a house to rent in Bombay as a but single is it because woman. Yeah, as oh a single God. woman, and I'm like, I'm famous. Do you want to take selfies with me? But you don't want to give me a house, you know. And then my mother got very, very sick, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was living in Gokila Ben for like two months. So it was like just boom, yeah. boom, boom, and suddenly having to deal with the financial constraints of all these things yeah. as well. No work. Uh, you you know you're not living with your partner anymore, so your costs double anyway. Yeah, and you have sick family. It's just like whoa, and yeah, lots of things were happening also, in like, my life. People don't realize that getting out of a relationship is not just that. Oh, you're not with that person anymore, but the person has impacted you in a way where it requires you to rebuild yourself at times, and of that course. takes a while as well. Yeah, for sure. You know, so yeah. along with, of course. All the sort of situational, you circumstantial know, like, kitsch, stuff. Of like having to like deal with your electrician, <laughs> you know, like and so you're like a single woman dealing with this like electrician coming to your house and yeah, yeah. It's, it's, Glad it's done. It's it's good. It's good to um. It's good to have that. It's good yeah. to like be strong on your own two feet. Mm. But it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. How do you know? Um, or how have you known? when it's been the right time to kind of walk out of a relationship? <laughs> I don't know if you ever really know. I don't know if there is a right time um, because I think all your relationships are there to teach you something. Hmm. Um, so this is a, me going very like philosophical and spiritual, but I, I know that I've had patterns that I've had to learn from and I kept repeating those patterns until I learned from them. Mm. Um, so I'm grateful for those relationships that I've had, which were difficult um, because they ultimately made me look at inside myself more. Mm. Um, but I think, how do you know? How do you know? I think when you start doubting yourself mm. all the time, um, that's a good sign. Uh, yeah. For me, I think that that was a good sign. And also when, um, like, I don't know, when you feel like, yeah, when you feel like you're just done, like you're tired, like mm. when, when all your energy is being taken away and you're not, you're not able to like put any energy into, into yourself. Um, maybe you're not able to receive as well. Mm. What give do you mean? as in like you can't give because you're tired. Mm. But sometimes mm. maybe you know you feel but yeah you're like you're closed yeah. up to receive yeah. too. Yeah, 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 for sure. Mm. But you know through all of this self work that you mentioned, like what does self work for Kalki entail? Because I'm asking you this because I have a feeling. Yeah. Uh, and I've spoken to a few people, and some people have this sort of when you ask them about like working on themselves. Uh, a lot of them come and say it's like oh I started hitting the gym mm. and I'm like there has to be more than working out <sighs> to working on yourself like yeah. of course that's one part of it so what has that self-work and undoing of those patterns been like for you what does that include I remember there was like a, a clear pattern of relationships that I was in and I was I'd kind of come to the end of it after a few of those and in that time when I was doing the self-work, I, I just started committing 
to spending time with myself every day. So I had a habit of, if I had finished my work early that day, I would just go to a friend's house or I would go out with some people or, you know, I would never just go home and be with myself mm. or I would call someone over, you know, it was, so it was just that. And I realized since I was a kid, I've always lived in community and in, in, in groups because I was in boarding school from the age of six. I lived in a, you know, community before that because I was born in Oroville. Um, I went uh, to university and I was living with, you know, all the, you, you have these hostels that you all live yeah. in. Uh, and then I was living with my boyfriend uh, in London. Then I came back to Bombay and I was living with my brother mm. uh, in in um, in Bangalore. And then I was living with friends in Bombay. You know, it was flatmates, then boyfriends. Then, and there was just no, I just had never been on my own. No solitude. No solitude. Mm. So I just started challenging myself and of course this was through therapy and and being aware of of this problem I, I wasn't even aware of this until my therapist was like what about trying this and um you know just pledging to myself that every day for even if it's just half an hour I will give myself that time hmm. and sometimes it was just really really hard to do even for half an hour yeah um so that that it can be as small as that hmm. um but I think as you grow and uh, you actually become greedy for that time. Once, once you get used to it, yeah. you're like, oh my God, I really need some solitude. I haven't had it for so long. I and need some silence. You need some silence. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, yeah, part of it is working out, meditation, uh, you know, just, just being out, being like whatever, taking care of yourself. Like it might be a massage or whatever. But some of that is also, you know, reading the books that you love, uh, writing about things that you care about, um, you know, meeting with groups of people who have similar thoughts, who want to create things, want to do things, um, you know, just opening yourself up to your own curiosities. Mm. Um, you know, if you weren't all these things that people say you are, what would you like to be? You know, sometimes you just need that. But no, that's that's actually very well said. Yeah. That, you know, if you aren't what people say you are, yeah. then who would you want to be? Yeah. I remember COVID really did that as well. Because during COVID, well, I was a, it was a double whammy for me because I had also had a baby in lockdown. But, um, you know, in general, the idea that, who you are didn't matter anymore. Yeah. Didn't matter how many trophies you'd won, what you'd done in your life, how many achievements, how much money you make. You were stuck at home. Yeah. And you had to face that. Face the little things in the daily little things. Yeah. And sometimes I'm just like, it maybe I just need to make some mint tea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, or go for a ride mm. on my cycle or whatever. It doesn't have to be to achieve a project yeah um and yeah covid was a double whammy because i was like also giving you know all my time and nutrition to this child yeah and to this newborn and i was like what happened to my life i was like this independent hard-working woman and now i'm just sitting at home milking like a cow and changing diapers every three hours and not sleeping and i was really like wow it was a it was hard hard times but was motherhood something that you consciously always wanted in your life um always no but i think some something did change in me i wasn't so keen in my 20s to have kids mm. i was quite like disillusioned by you know this sort of like world that we're living in with climate change and uh like what kind of future are we bringing our yeah. child into and there's too many people in the world we're overpopulated so these were my thoughts early yeah. on um and i guess i just threw all that logic out the window for something that was very biologically connected to my body yeah. you know somewhere in my 30s i was like oh actually i just really want a, a child and i i i think it came from seeing my little brother so my dad had had a child quite late he got remarried and had a child so my little brother you know I'd see I I saw this renewal of innocence in a child 
um, which we as adults forget in our daily whatever we're getting grind of getting through things and paying the bills and getting on with life we forget what it is to be excited about a you know solar powered project or mm -hmm. you know how we're going to save the world in this way and kids really care about saving the world yeah they really do they get really into their projects and i saw that in my younger brother mm. and i think that kind of made me feel like yeah i do believe in a renewal of innocence mm. and i didn't know how much it meant until i actually had a child because you relive your own childhood through your child and you really face your own traumas as well as your strong points and if you're a i mean if you're able to kind of sift through that it's very healing it's very very healing um yeah it's it's one of like those like strange things. nobody's ever described that uh, experience as healing yeah it's you know because it's interesting it, it, it takes a lot to get to that point i think if you read my my book the elephant in the womb you only you only hear the the horrors of pregnancy and parenting in the in the best kind of way in the you know like I don't need to talk about how wonderful and beautiful children are because we only hear that yeah. you know but we don't hear about the real trauma that a woman's body goes through and all the other psychological elements of it so I wanted to write about that but having said that like I just felt like I've I had to learn to be with myself even more when I was with Sappho because there was nothing else there was this little growing creature that i had to take care of and keep alive yeah and and then there was just like me and who am i uh, within this framework it was like you have to you have to rearrange yourself along with this other person and i don't know i don't know it's very it's very complicated complicated psychological schooling that you go through when you have a child yeah like um, my mother says you'll only know when you become a mother it's very yeah it's very hard to describe yeah. it it's really hard to describe it but definitely i feel like i've become like the things i used to run away from i've started facing uh you know the the patient impatience that i had i've started like finding patience I even things like you know how i would i grew up in an environment a lot of like achievement based like you know like everything had to be an achievement and it's taken me a lot to unlearn that mm. and through my daughter and watching her just you know open up a package of cardboard stuff and put it back and open it up and put it back and be really like focused on doing it without any end result mm. like she's just doing she's doing something and you can't if i'm like hey we need to go out now she's like are you kidding me i'm in the middle of this you know it's almost like imagine if you and i are having this meeting and somebody's like hey need you need you guys to leave now no we're in the middle of a podcast she's mm -hmm. like so into her thing yeah and i'm like it, it's so important for me to see that nothing ha it, that thing can be it it doesn't yeah. have to have an end pro product yeah um, it doesn't even have to be big that doesn't have thing. to be big it doesn't yeah. have to have an end product it's something that you are learning at that point and mm. you know i will be sometimes i can't compute what i am doing in my self time i'm like oh my god i'm just wasting and wailing and like just letting this time wither away i'm i should be doing something i should be making a project i should be doing a play as you know mm. there's this tendency in me but lately i've also been like i'll find out why i'm wallowing at some point at some point it'll compute that yeah. i'm learning something new hmm. um it's like my daughter was learning uh, so my daughter was listening to four languages growing up french from me yeah my husband uh, hebrew my nanny hindi and english right from everybody yeah. else she wasn't speaking a word all my friends were like she's so quiet she never talks till three she was not talking at all and then suddenly out of nowhere she just started speaking each language fluently wow to all the right people this one in hindi this one in french so i'm like you know that those 3 years of silence were actually computing she was her brain was doing stuff yeah subconsciously she yeah. was assimilating all yeah, of it yeah she was assimilating so i feel like we don't give enough time to that to that assimilation as adults yeah
Yeah. But I'm, do you get in in an industry as fast paced as yours, which I believe, or my limited understanding of it is also, it's quite sort of competitive. Mm. Um, you know, because now there's still a lot more content that gets churned out because of OTT, right? You have so many sort of web shows and, yeah. um, of course, theater is one, but, uh, you know, in terms of film and, and you know, your TV series, yeah. um, it's, it's a very fast paced sort of competitive space because, you know, those really iconic, well-written roles is something I believe many people are sort of auditioning and eyeing for. Mm. Um, do you then feel the need to protect yourself even more to allow yourself the time to compute and assimilate whatever it is that you want to? I don't know. I mean, I just, yeah, I guess I'm not running the Olympics. Like for me, it's not a fast paced thing. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah, I, I'm going to be doing some form of, you know, theater, film, writing, artwork, creating work. This work is going to be mine for my lifetime. Mm. I own that. Nobody can take that away from me. Even if, even if I'm doing it in a little attic somewhere in the middle of nowhere, I'm still creating that work for something, you know? Yeah. So that is precious to me and I want to keep doing it in whichever forms I can and and I hope to keep doing it. I mean, I, that's all I hope for, you know, to have, to have that, to have the ability to just keep doing work. Um, that's a very rare spirit. I mean, I guess, I don't know, is it? I, I think everybody wants to be allowed to, to express. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I can only think of, you know, apocalyptic circumstances that can stop that you know mm. i mean you know with everything that's happening in the world like that could stop that that kind of creation but even you know even then like i don't think you can really stop somebody from creating no that's a hundred percent true but you know i mean it more in terms of let's say social media now social media numbers oh. are considered <laughs> while you're getting hired <laughs> and, yeah. and that's something i find so bizarre yeah. that, that people get roles Yes. based on what the social media following is. And, yes. and that's what I mean by competitive because it's like one has to up the other in some way, mm. you know, to kind of get those good writing parts. Because mm. I, I know people who have gotten jobs. Based on that. Yeah. No, absolutely. I know friends who've, who've lost jobs on, on the basis of having fewer followers than somebody else. Yeah, it's very tough. Yeah. I, I guess I'm just, maybe I'm just lucky that I was already here before that started mm. like this whole social media started what in 2015 yeah 16 that's when it really yeah. blew up right yeah, seven eight years ago yeah so we were already doing stuff before that mm. um it is i can't even imagine how how tough it is for a young person to start now with that element but it also gives easy money that's i think the flip side yeah yeah I think you have to always know that social media is not real, you mm. know. I think, I haven't seen it, I mean, I've seen it really like, I've seen the same people like on trolling me for one thing and then praising me for another thing. You know, I've seen. Really? Yeah, I've seen things where like, oh, finally you've said this or fine, oh, you didn't say this before. I don't know, like the it just depends on what, which part of their, you know, belief you tap into, or, mm, or what you've triggered. What you've triggered. Yeah. So, I just, I, I, I do, kind of. I mean, I, I do like to be as real as I can and put the things I want out there, yeah. but I also take a step away from it whenever it gets overwhelming. I, I don't have a problem with like, you know, deleting my, my app for a few days if mm. it's bothering me if it's making me so sad yeah i'll delete it for a few days the sky isn't going to fall on my head yeah true you know and i think that people forget that and people also who've lived and grown up with social media i mean th th there's a great ted talk i heard which scares the shit out of me for my daughter's future yeah 
which is talking about how teenagers' psychology has changed because they've grown up with social media. Um, because not just social, yeah, like obviously social media, but also all your, yeah. so basically all your friends, friendship groups, for example, hmm. are online, right? Yeah. Rather than interacting in real. And he was explaining the, the, the science behind it, that when, when you're in person, there's a lot of um, subtle, subtle things that happen. Um, you know, maybe you look down and put your cup down for a second. Maybe you've lost interest or, you know, that you, or we'll, op I'll be like very excited and talk to you yeah. like this. So whatever there's all these movements and there's an exchange of energy. There's an exchange of energy, but also like physical, you just subconsciously read the other person's um, body language. Yeah. And, you know, and in that circumstance, there's a lot more um, space for things to go wrong and get back to, hmm. to right. Hmm. Um, so, you know, he was saying what happens is when you're on these social media friendship groups or, you know, like on a group with your friends, there's no other way to be than to perform hmm. because you're, you're performing for everybody in that group. Um, and if you say something wrong, it's a landmine because hmm. you can just be canceled. Yeah. And it's like a landmine for these little kids because they're so nervous and anxious about every little thing they say. Whereas if you make a mistake, like if we're in a group of friends playing in the playground and I say something mean to you, you know, you in that moment that person looks down, then you immediately realize what you did. You're like, oh, I'm sorry. And there's this whole like reading that happens in yeah. between which allows you to go past that. But here, that's it. That's your one moment. You're up your yeah. it's over it you're is yeah, yeah yeah and so they're growing up with that kind of anxiety yeah it's a lot um, it's too much and our nervous systems are not meant to deal with so much information and somehow know how to translate it how to filter it how to uh, you know be on the right side of that information and honestly most of that information is wrong yeah so it's a very very dicey Thing to grow up with it's different when you didn't grow up with it hmm. your psychology is is able to deal with not existing on those platforms you know recently um i, I i've seen videos of little girls um doing like get ready with me like seven-year-old girls who are going hmm. to school yeah you know and it's like i'm wearing my lip balm and you know this is how i'm yeah. gonna do my hair and you know the beauty standards that the internet has yeah. set especially for women. Yeah. Um, um, bizarre. The, the, this TED Talk also talks about how much more it's affecting girls and like the anxiety levels. Their self-worth. Yeah. Everything is much more uh, for girls because of this. But you know, like I just feel bad because I feel like we have already been living in a world where mm. largely Mm. Um, you know, we judge or gauge a woman's sort of worth based on her beauty. Mm. And now we've added another sort of zoom lens we've taken onto our, that. Our childhood away from our kids. Yeah. We're taking childhood away from them. It's really sad. Because I I look at my pictures when I was like ten years old, I look really bad. And we all look we all bad. looked really awkward and uh, bad. The teenage and phase. I, I never thought I would okay, maybe I did like sometimes I got teased for my braces or whatever, but I never, you know, had this like terrible self image. Yeah. But now because it's on social media and you're compared to these perfect things or whatever, like you just you you grow up with this terrible self image. And yeah. I know it affects me also, you know, yeah. and I'm somebody who's lived outside of this world and you know, I, you know, I don't spend all my time on social media and I've also known life without social media. But there have been times where I've questioned if I'm a good person mm -hmm. because of what people have said online about me. What's the worst thing you've read about yourself? Oh, just like, you know, things like hope you and your family get... What? Yeah, like hor horrible. Oh, people, Lord, people are who are really these people? Horrible. Yeah. No, there's a lot That's of hate disgusting. out there. disgusting. Yeah. There's a lot of hate out there. I mean, really horrible things. But the point is that that for yeah, so like I've I felt that absolute sinking low of feeling like, oh, I'm not maybe I'm not a good person. Mm. 
And somehow, you know, getting away from that and being like, okay, wait, how do I treat the people in my vicinity? What do I do on a daily basis? You know, yeah. and like being able to be back in touch with that. But yeah. for a lot of people, if your core support system is online, yeah. if your core friends are not people you can just reach out to one-on-one -on -one or physically like meet on a daily basis, and then it's really, really lonely out there. Yeah. And you understand why people are like killing themselves over stuff like that. It's, it's a, terrible. It's, it's a tough world to raise kids in. It's really scary. Yeah. Yeah. That's why we moved to Goa. I would imagine <laughs> so. And, and I feel like a little bit. Get away of, from the screens. You know, I read somewhere that you'd chosen waterboarding. And I think that's when I knew that you would make slightly different choices because yeah. I've never heard anyone choose that experience. Anyone that I know, yeah. what was it like? And why did you choose to do it? Um, I chose to do it because if you're going to choose to have a natural vaginal birth, it's yeah. the like it's supposed to be the most comfortable both for the mother and the baby. Uh, obviously, the baby is in amniotic fluid, so yeah. coming out in water is slightly is is a, a smoother transition, and also for the dilation process for the mother. It's just, a, you know, firstly, your body weight is suspended in the water. Yeah. Um, and the dilation, dilation process just eases up a lot. The, the body just relaxes a lot more. So I'd read about all this and it seemed to me like a much wiser option. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why it's not a standard. Like, yeah. why don't you just put the woman in a, in a, in a tub, in a tub, mm. like for birthing? It seems quite obvious to me. Mm. Um, the other thing that was obvious to me uh, from so much reading was that lying on a bed is like not natural at all to give birth. Mm. Uh, if you look at you know the way people used to do it back in the day, they were squ squatting, yeah. they were walking. It's a very physical activity to give birth. And to make the woman just lie there, is, it, it's really hard to give birth just lying down. Mm. So, you know, I think we've just out of conveniences of keeping people in hospital, like the way we've con made it more convenient to have quicker births. Yeah. I think all of these things have created the way things are now. But, it, you know, it's just much more organic that way. Mm. Very unusual choice for a for a celebrity. <laughs> yeah, I, a lot of people choose their date and get a yeah. C-section done. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, and I mean, I, I I understand that too because like this is like gruesome mm. on your vagina. You know, you really, you do spend a lot of time recovering from it. Um, and it's not easy. So I understand also that that sort of, although C-section also has its own baggage yeah. you know for the first four months you can't do any exercise you can't sit you can't squat you can't do so many things mm. so that that has its own baggage too um for some reason you know one is sort of played up more than the other mm. nobody wants to talk about i get i don't know the post not a lot of people want to talk about the the recovery process yeah it's more about how quickly you got back to your old genes, yeah. how quickly you got back to work. But nobody talks about the, the long process, no matter which way you go about it, hmm. um, of recovery, you know. How so, long did it take you to recover? I mean, I think, you know, it depends uh, physically or mentally. because Both, uh, physically. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think that it takes a good eight to nine months. Yeah. Um, physically, of course, you're, you're back, you're ready to, you know, have your next baby in the next, in like three, four months. Mm. But, but mentally, I think your body is so nurturing this child and your body is so focused on that aspect, um, and giving so much of yourself to it that you don't have space for anything else. Um, 
and for me, I mean, there was there was some there was some co complications. You'll have to read my book, chapter eight, for that. Done. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it really it was so much about finding my own confidence in myself again, more than about the physical aspect. Hmm. Um, it was so much about like letting myself go out for a drink, or you know, hanging out with my girlfriends, or just doing things for myself, mm. which you don't feel like you can do when you have this tiny creature that is completely dependent on you and that you have to keep alive. Yeah. You know, I mean, after that one or two days in the hospital, they just like take this and you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? And you ha it's very precious and very like fragile. Yeah. And, and then you're like, you're I waking chose up to in, do this. Yeah. So. And you're waking up in the middle of the night to check. Is, it, is she still breathing? You know, because she hasn't moved in so many hours. Yeah. And you're paranoid. You're paranoid. So it's like, a, you know, like a tiger in the jungle, like guarding its infants from like grizzlies or something. Yeah. You know, you're just like really in that cave woman energy. Yeah. So you don't, for those first six months, I didn't, also you don't get your period yeah. for the first six months. So it is really like your body is like not ready for reproducing it's not ready for anything else it's just here in this like nurturing phase so yeah that process takes a while um and and, and in that process being able to tell yourself that you can take two hours off that you can leave your baby with somebody else and they they won't like die, let it die yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you're you're just like hanging i think that umbilical cord is still there yeah invisibly there for the next like eight months wow food for thought <laughs> <laughs> yes you don't I have will, kids ah uh, yeah whenever it is <laughs> whenever it is that that happens um i will read the book <laughs> please before do that as yeah prep. absolutely but um you know I, it occurred to me as i said unusual choice for celebrity and the word celebrity came into my mind and I had uh, seen an interview of Emily Blunt in which she said that Killian Murphy is the best actor that she's worked with and the worst celebrity that she's been around. Okay. And, and that's because he's not, you know, he's very sort of elusive and, you know, he kind of keeps to himself and he's very awkward with his sort of fame and success. Mm -hmm. What does being a celebrity mean for you? It means a lot of selfies at the airport. Hmm. <laughs> I've surrendered that my airport time is only for selfies. Um, apart from that, I don't really think the celebrity thing affects my daily life. Would Would you feel bad if if somebody didn't? If there was a day when somebody didn't ask you for a selfie? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'd be grateful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right now, like. Right now, I feel bad a little bit because people come and take a selfie and then say, what's your name? What's your name? Come on. Yeah, many people So then they that. recognize the face and they're like, this is, we've seen her somewhere. Yeah, like we've seen her, but that's it. Mm. And they still want a selfie. Um, I wonder what, what would you I do Also, with I've had people say, um, take a selfie and then say, what made you quit acting? <laughs> Wow. Yeah, because they haven't seen me on screen for a long time. So, yeah, this is all like part and parcel of it. And accepting that, you know, there's a there's changes yeah. in your in your evolution and who you are. And yeah, I mean, there might come a day where I'm not acting on screen at all. I don't know. Hmm. Um, or maybe not. But I just I don't think for me it's like it I don't hang on to that celebrityness hmm. too much. Um, I have so much of life outside of that. Hmm. There's so much more going on. There's so much interest in so many other things. You know, there's there's the world to look at. There's yeah. people. There's stories to listen to. There's there's you know you know your children in front of you growing and the I don't know. There's just too much stuff going on to yeah. worry about that. <laughs> to worry about whether somebody asked me for a selfie or not. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of chat on the internet, okay? And we're finally going to get your opinion on this because these are your characters. <laughs> so one, and I, and I want you to bust these myths, okay? So one 
discussion is that Natasha your character in uh, Zindagi Na Milengi Dobara uh, was very misunderstood okay and she was mi- misunderstood because any woman whose mm. partner is on a bachelor's trip with his guy friends if she kind of saw him with the random girl in the frame while they're on video call she would be perturbed maybe not enough to go there yeah. you know on the sly yeah. but but that's not a very pleasant thing so what was well, your it's, sort it's of all a question of degree isn't it like mm. i can be jealous and i can state that and i'm like, oh my god katrina kaif is hot as well yeah. like who the fuck is that yeah. you can be those things but there's a difference between like admitting to your vulnerabilities like that and wanting to only just have control over it hmm i think that's the difference yeah that's where she slightly goes on the psycho yeah. side yeah. and maybe needs a little therapy i think showing up was a bit yeah like that was, that showing up psycho. without saying anything yeah. um is is a little intense she could be like this is not on hmm she could be like i don't accept that you are with like all these hot women during your bachelors and don't tell me about it or anything i've not yeah. this is the first time hearing of it she you know that takes yeah and i would respect that but i think to kind of just take control of the situation without really giving the other person a chance to say what the, yeah what their stand is is where it goes off <laughs> yeah like i would never show up but i would definitely express my yeah sort of for sure. you know like what's for going sure. on this yeah. is a bit odd what kind of bachelor yeah. trip is this and let's have the rules clearly placed yeah. now you know yeah. cuz then i'm also going on a on a <laughs> bachelorette trip bachelor trip and, and then she shows up and then he's like got katrina in his in arms, his arms. Yeah. and then she's the churel so i think that's what the internet is very divided on like natasha didn't get justice right you know like i said i think it's a question of degree hmm um sure you can always uh, vouch for her and i think that uh you know if this was not a bollywood film and it was real life there's there's a lot of scope to see where the man is just sort of excused yeah for doing whatever um especially in our society mm. um boys will be boys they do what they do and all of that so i think it's fair enough for a girl to question that but i think that it's just as important that uh, communication yeah is 100% is both ways yeah. and not just one way yeah what do you think about the end of ye jawani ye diwani do you think bunny was a selfish character i really didn't spend a lot of time thinking about him <laughs> 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 why why is he a selfish character because i mean when you see the movie yeah. right like He, yeah, does he, he, he does whatever he wants. He does whatever he wants through it. Yeah, throughout. he's not until his f- father passes away. Then, then too, he doesn't like. He doesn't show up. He doesn't show up. Yeah. There's there's no sort of change in behavior. There's no taking accountability. Okay. Right. Yeah. And uh, he's kind of always self driven <laughs> and whatever. So all of that aside, my problem is with the end. And uh-huh. maybe I don't know if I've interpreted this correctly. So you know. Yeah. Uh but my understanding of it was that you know in the end when he kind of shows up, right? Mm. You are on your honeymoon at mm. the airport and you're all doing this call in the movie, right? When you're saying happy new year. Yeah. And and he is with Nena. Yeah. And he's gone and he's told her that you know I didn't go on this trip and now, you know, will you marry me and not in the most sort of blah way. Yeah. You know? and then he's just like and she's like you know what about your dreams and he's like now we'll do all of that but with two tickets so now what she's supposed to be fulfilling his dreams that's it's terrible isn't it yeah well you're going to have to ask ayan i don't know maybe he just meant a honeymoon trip you know maybe she but he travels for work we'll have to wait for yejwani hadiwani too is there a possibility if she's, if she's still a doctor in that yeah um No no this I have heard no such rumors. I think that some films I feel like yeah you can't make another one. I would be scared one. to have like a sequel. It'll be hard it'll it'll be hard to get yeah. that. 
Somebody's and usually, actually, most sequels are not as disappointing. Yeah. It's rare to have a good sequel. Made in Heaven as a series, though. But that's a Super, series. A yeah. series is different. I than, love your character. You know, there's a moment in season two hmm. where uh, your partner is sitting in the car and I think he's just come after sort of cheating uh, on Feza. And huh. you're going to meet the half sister. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and you're sitting, and uh, he says, uh, and you're like, you know, why did you agree to come? And he says, uh, because you only have good intentions. And there's, there's just a small smile and like a glint in the eye. And I thought you were fantastic. And just Aww. that one <laughs> flash. Thank you. So good. Love, love, love that show. I think it's incredible. Yeah, it's a good show. It's a great it's show. A I'm, show. I'm hoping season three. Yeah, me too. I want some work. <laughs> <laughs> what are you working on currently? I'm working on a project called Ghost Hunters. Hmm. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's based on a true story hmm. on, and it's on paranormal activity. Interesting. So, yeah, there's been lots of juicy stuff happening on set. But they always say that, you know, when you're... A lot of paranormal these? stuff. Yeah, but oh, does, yeah. is that true? Like flickering of lights. We're just, yeah, all the time. All the time. We're all like, whoa. And I'm not much of a believer. Some people are like, you know, on my set, it's quite divided. Some people are like real believers and some are not. But we've all agreed that some weird shit is going down. Yeah. 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 Have you ever experienced something paranormal? No. I, nothing that's been really solid proof for me. Hmm. But I've had friends who've like sworn by really really scary uh, experiences yeah i've had situations where i've been freaked out a little of course i still have sometimes but nothing which makes me go like i really saw a ghost this is a ghost and it can't be anything else you know yeah yeah so kalki as we sort of approach the end of our conversation a question i usually ask everyone is what they do to unwind after us so when you're kind of you know, not shooting this. Yeah. What is it that you're doing to just relax? Like everybody else, probably watching a show on. What are you watching <laughs> currently? Or on. Yeah, I yeah, should yeah. say. Mask, I mask should say. On, yeah. Huh. Um, what's the last. Like, really, uh, most recently, I've really enjoyed finishing Hacks. Uh, okay, it's like a comedy seen. show. Oh, it's really fun. You Have gotta you seen watch Sweet it. Sweet Bobby? No. This documentary about how a woman got catfished for nine years. Oh my God. She got engaged to a guy online mm. and she had never met him. Mm. And it's just, it's a bizarre story. Wow. Yeah. But. Yeah. So I've, yeah, I like, I like watching something light or extremely dark, like serial killer shows or, mm. you know, I, I'm very extreme in those ways. Either it has to be like really like funny, like, you know, flea bag kind of. Oh, what, that a, kind what, of what show. a brilliant show, yeah. Playback. Or it has to be like, you know, Baby Reindeer. Like really intense. Oh my God, again, very <laughs> iconic. Baby Reindeer had me hooked. Oh yeah. I couldn't, so I couldn't good. stop watching it. Yeah. It was like, it was so uncomfortable. Yeah. But also like, how do you resist then knowing more? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, nuts. Crazy nuts. show. But then I sometimes watch like really good garbage things like love is blind you know like those oh, reality yeah. tv <laughs> oh, dating I, I shows hate they, reality i it's it's like the cringe you know yeah binge when you just like mindless stuff that's kind of just playing and when you're cleaning your yeah. room or something yeah, yeah, like yeah, that yeah, yeah. also it makes you realize that there are all kinds of people in this world mm. and some of them will really surprise you yeah but i see enough of that in real world <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. like why would i want to watch People being shitty on screen. I see too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you the stories off camera. <laughs> but no, Karki, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a splendid chat. Thank and you. It's, it's uh, a pleasure. I really look you. forward to, you know, all the interesting things that you're up to. And I'd love to come watch a play whenever you're doing yes. it. I'll let you know. Yeah. I don't have any plays right now. Yeah, whenever you do, I'd I'd love to come yeah. watch you perform because I actually love watching theater. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. You're based in Delhi, so yeah, when whenever you come, you come to Delhi. Please I'll let me know. Keep it in mind. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Fanny. Bye.